Good morning. We have a sunny day today. How rare. Yes. I will take all the credit for it. Thank you so much. Well, it is bright and beautiful in here as well with your presence in our sanctuary. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we hear Sally's prelude. That was the first interpretive dance that I've ever seen to Ave Maria. <laughs> yep. Let us now join together in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God that made us and we are God's. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture.
You may be seated. Our psalm for the day comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. God restores my soul. God leads me in right paths for God's name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. May this sacred text meet us with increased understanding and knowledge. It's good to see young people in worship today as well as those of us who are young at heart as well. Today is Mother's Day and so I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers in the room including my own. Hi mom. (laughs) Happy Mother's Day. Um, I want to share with you before our children go to their Sunday school classes I want to share with them and with all of you, this beautiful book. It recently came out. It's named Mother God, and it's by Teresa Kim Pesanovsky, and it's illustrated by Koa Lee, and it is a gorgeous telling um, of all the ways that God is like a mother to us. Um, And I'm just going to read some of the pages, and you will see the illustrations up on the screens. You know God the Father, But God is your mother, too. You are made in her image. She is making all things new. God is a mother hen who gathers chicks under her wings. She plays hide and seek in soft grass behind trees and quiet springs. She protects her cubs from danger. God, the great mother bear. As fierce as she is tender, she guards them in her care. With a huge supply of flour God needs and bakes good bread, she feeds her entire neighborhood. They feast and all are fed. She is the God who sees you. God weeps, mourns, and cries. She comforts you through the longest night, keeping watch until sunrise. God is your loving mother. You are made in her image too. God calls you beloved. She is making all things new. Would you all pray with me? Loving and gracious God, thank you for loving us, protecting us, caring for us, nurturing us, and being there for us, just like a mother. We thank you this day for all of those people in our lives who have mothered us, whether they are our own mothers or someone else's mother, or all of those people, no matter who they are, who have nurtured us and helped us grow, just as you have. In your son's name we pray. Amen. It is now time for children in fifth grade and younger to head to their classrooms. I see Julie and Marianne in the back of the room waving to you. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, children, for being here. And allow me to say to everyone else in the room, good morning. It's great to see you on this beautiful day here at First Community North on this beautiful Mother's Day as we celebrate with families not only here in this church but indeed around the world. And I want to say I want to say good morning to Sarah's mom too. It's nice to see you. I'm glad I'm glad you're here. And I also want to say hello. I'm going to indulge you all for just a moment here. I want to say hello to my mom who likes to get up early out on the West Coast and and watch us online. Mom, good morning. Glad to see you. Happy Mother's Day. And I'm going to call you this afternoon. I promise. These are my witnesses, so I can't get away from it. 
glad you're here. And also not just only to my mom, but everyone who's watching on Facebook or on fcchurch.com, on YouTube, some of the other channels that we provide for you. We're glad that you're joining us in worship on this day. And if you would, please sign in. On Facebook, you can use the comment section to the right of the screen and let us know where you're watching from. On fcchurch.com, there's a link you can tap on while you're watching. And again, register your attendance with us and say hello and give a, a prayer concern if you have that need. Same thing in the room. Hopefully most of you know by now you can use the QR code on those cards that are placed around the sanctuary, hold your cameras, uh, um, your phone's camera option over it, click on it, click on the link that pops up, sign in, register a, a prayer concern, you can even give to the offering if you choose to do on that way, so in that way. As we did say, today is Mother's Day. It is a beautiful day for many. It's also a day that comes with a mixture of emotions for many others. There are a variety of reasons for this. For some, it's because they were not mothered the way they would have desired or hoped to have been. Still, for others, they may have wanted children, but for whatever reason were unable to bring a child into this world. And, and the, 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 the reasons and the concerns are, are many, many indeed. Tim Van Sant has a beautiful pastoral prayer this morning where he names this, names this concern. And just, I want us to be aware that we can both celebrate and at the same time keep in mind in our prayers especially those who for whatever reason find this day to be a difficult one. This is a day, though, that I trust you'll be able to perhaps take a deep breath and, induce, and in so doing, exhale all the worries and anxieties and cares of the day and allow the very Spirit of God to fill that place, to open your heart, your mind, your body, even your soul, to be ready and prepared for whatever word God brings to you in this moment, whether through the music or the readings, through the sermon or the prayers, or some other way, maybe even in a, the kind greeting of a friend in the narthex. Be aware of the Spirit's presence and allow it to work on you. Let's continue to worship. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious and caring God, as a wise mother, you have placed mothers and those who have been like mothers in our lives. We thank you for the people who have cared for us, taught us, nurtured us, mentored us, and helped us grow. We also pray for those who find Mother's Day a difficult time, those who have lost or never knew, or who had difficult relationships with their mothers. We pray for those who have suffered the loss of a child and those who want to have children but cannot. Heal their wounds and bind up broken hearts. Wisdom often aptly takes feminine form in the Bible. In Proverbs it is stated, does not wisdom call out, does not understanding raise her voice. At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. 
Just as the first Mother's Day in the United States was organized by a female abolitionist as a celebration for the eradication of war, let us embrace our feminine wisdom. Let us embrace this wisdom as we fight for women's rights that have been stripped here and abroad. Like a mother protecting her children, let us fight for the equality and protection of all while showing compassion to those that are oppressed. We recognize God loves us like an ideal mom. You have compassion for all your children, which is to say all of humanity without exception. Let us embrace this as we strive for the beloved community you have envisioned for us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, who taught us to, say, to pray by saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Camp Akita, which is a near and dear place to many people in here, um, has been on my mind a lot lately. First off, my best friend in the whole wide world, Sarah Keens, is leaving me for the summer. We're best friends, right? Yes. She said yes. At the 9 o'clock, she said no. So uh, that's progress. And uh, second of all, uh, I've recently taken on some additional duties, which have given me a front row seat to everything that has to happen to make Camp Akita happen. All the time and resources and staff and volunteers is what it takes to make Camp Akita inclusive and a place that has the potential to change the lives of our youth. So anytime you give of your time, talent, and treasure, you make a special place like Camp Akita happen. And for that, we thank you. Let us worship now with our offering.
as the gifts are presented would all rise in body or spirit. And let us pray. Holy One of blessing, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating love. With them we offer our varied ministries in the days of ahead, that each of us, us must answer the cries of the world. Amen. may be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from Acts chapter 9 verses 36 through 43. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clo clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time, with a certain Simon, a tanner. May the Spirit move us to deeper understanding of these words. And let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, you call us to an abundant feast at a table of your word. Open our hearts to feed on your goodness, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we might dwell more deeply evermore in you. Amen. There's a tendency in the church when there's a rousing anthem or, or a loud and, and vivacious solo to offer applause. And then there's an, also a, a very acceptable tendency when the music is quieter and, and seems to set a tone of, of quiet reflection in the sanctuary to allow that to be there. But we want our musicians to know we appreciate the beauty of what they do. Would you thank them this morning for their work? When I was in the eighth grade, I was attending a church in downtown Los Angeles where my father was the pastor. The church decided to do something that year that was quite radical and unusual. They were going to hold a Sunday evening worship service. Now that idea in and of itself wasn't that unusual. Many uh, churches in a, of a more evangelical style back in those days had Sunday evening worship services. That itself wasn't unusual, but the focus of who they were going to invite was. They were going to focus on 18 to 30-year-olds, specifically those who had become a part of a movement in Southern California called the Jesus People. My dad, the pastor at the church, was a volunteer in this Jesus movement. They would meet on Saturday nights, typically at Santa Monica Beach, around a campfire for Bible study and some songs. It started out with a couple dozen people. It began to grow 
and grow and grow. And pretty soon it was more than a Bible study. There was a sermon and there was music, guitar music, basically folk rock, but not the kind of thing you'd hear on a Sunday morning in, in worship, not in those days in, anyway. And so the church said, what if we reached out to these young adults who are finding their way to these worship services on the beach and invited them to participate in our church. We'd be able to, to encourage them and, and help them. Many of the people in the Jesus movement were folks who had been caught up in alcoholism or, or drug addiction or had been abused or had other serious issues in their life. The church's idea was invite these folks to participate with us in worship, to become a part of our community of faith, and we can provide resources to help them and encourage them and, and help them live full, full and meaningful lives. A great idea. And so they did. They invited the folks down to the beach where my dad was one of the preachers to come on Sunday night to, to join at the church and participate in a worship service there and to be introduced to the many members in that congregation. The first night was a rousing success. Now, the sanctuary was about half as big as ours is right here, but it had seated close to 300 people, at least 200, maybe 250, 18 to 30-year-olds made their way into that sanctuary. My dad was alive and roused up in the pulpit. The music was great. Again, it was guitars and drums and different kinds of things that you didn't see back then, but there was an emergency board meeting called the next day. The folks who came to that worship service, they showed up in jeans. Some of these young men had really long hair and beards, not white ones like this one, but beards. The women who attended, they wore jeans too, not dresses, and their hair was long and straight. They didn't do anything to, to fix it up in, in the big bouffant like many people did back in the 60s and 70s. No. And some of them, many of them, male and female, were barefoot. What are we going to do about this? That was the question at the emergency board meeting the next day. How are we going to respond to this? What will we do with, and here's a quote, with those people? How will we respond to them? What will we do? What ways can we treat them? They need to understand. They need to understand their dress, their demeanor, their music is going to hurt us. It's going to cause our business plan to fall apart. Our giving will go down. Our membership will go down. People will leave the church. This is a disaster. Three weeks later, the services were canceled. You'll not be surprised to know that many years ago, that church closed permanently. The building now sits empty. Uh, on first glance, we might say that the reason for their decline was their unwillingness to e allow the culture to influence the way they shared their message, to bring the ancient great word, the beautiful word of God's love given to the world, and find a way that it would fit in within that culture. And because they refused to change and evolve with the changing needs of the, those around them, that's why the church began to decline. There's some truth in that, but I think the deeper root of their decline and their eventual closure was their failure to open their arms as wide as the arms of Jesus to welcome, and not only welcome, but accept. Too many churches out there say, we welcome you, now change. No, welcome and accept, no matter what their background might be, no matter what they might be caught up in, no matter what their faith or lack of faith may be, in the name of God's love given to the world, bring them in to the church. But sometimes it's hard to be inclusive. Sometimes it's difficult to truly welcome anyone and everyone, no matter what their sexual background might be, no matter what their heritage may be, no matter where they're from. Sometimes it's hard to do that. But if it's hard, maybe it's a sign that it's the right thing to do. And this sermon series is inspired by Rachel Held Evans' book of the same title, Inspired. She's a brilliant theologian who was taken from us way too soon at the age of, of 37, but her works continue to resonate not only in, in this community, but around the country and around the globe. Uh, listen to what she has to say about this very idea. The apostles remembered what many modern Christians tend to forget, that what makes the gospel offensive isn't who it keeps out, but who it lets in. What makes the gospel offensive isn't who it keeps out, but who it lets in. The Church of Jesus Christ is at its best 
when we see no barriers to inclusion, when we see no walls set up to divide, when we see no, no fences around this table or around our fellowship or anything else. The church of Jesus Christ is at its best when it goes to the edges, to the margins, to, to the least, to lost, the last, and the little, as Robert Capon loved to say, to those who've been left behind too often, forgotten too many times by those who say they care. The church is at its best when it goes to those places and says, of course, yes, you are a child of God and you are welcome here. In this sermon series, we're going to listen to stories like this from the book of Acts, stories of inclusion, stories of welcome, stories where over and over again, the very spirit of God, according to the book of Acts, is at work in the community, breaking down the walls, tearing away the fences, opening God's love up to the entire world. In fact, just before the text that we heard today from from Acts chapter 9, there's a story in chapter 8 of an Ethiopian eunuch. I won't get into grisly detail about how one becomes a eunuch. If you're not sure, well, it's Mother's Day. Ask your mom. She can let you know. But seriously, to be a eunuch in antiquity was to be someone who was looked down upon, sometimes even despised. Their unusual sexuality made people uncomfortable to be around them. In fact, even in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a text that clearly says, I remember as a jet cadet for Jesus when I was in the fifth grade, looking up this text, and sure enough, it says, if you're a eunuch, but it gives very graphic detail, frankly, you are not welcome in the assembly of the Lord. And yet, this Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8 that Luke writes about in the book of Acts, he's made his way just outside the temple in Jerusalem. And he's listening for the readings and the prayers, the psalms. And he hears a reading from Isaiah 53. The ancient prophet says he was led to the slaughter silently like a sheep. The eunuch wonders, who could this be? What is this about? He hears an echo of his own travail. Well, he makes his way back out to the desert, to the wilderness, to return to his homeland. And at the same time, a man named Philip, a leader in the early church, is moved by the Spirit. Who knows how that happens, but he's moved by the Spirit. He pays attention to this movement to go out and travel into the desert himself. And the next thing you know, their paths cross. And he sees the Ethiopian eunuch who is reading again from Isaiah 53. And the the eunuch says, can you explain this to me? And he says, I'd be happy to. Those of us in the church, we see in those words a reflection of the one we call Jesus, the Christ, who gave his life, who was silently led to the slaughter, but the slaughter was not the end. The slaughter was only the beginning. He, He, through the power of love, was victorious over death. And now he rules and we follow in his way, in the ways of love and grace. Well, they happen to be nearby a pool of water and the eunuch looks at the pool and says to Philip, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Hear this word, nothing, nothing. It's a beautiful and amazing story. There is nothing that turns any of us away from the graciousness of of the waters of God. Every time you walk into this sanctuary and every time you walk out of this sanctuary through those doors, you walk by that baptismal font, a sign that that everyone is received in the name of grace and everyone is sent back out in that same name. Then we go to the story of Tabitha, the story we heard read this morning. The name Tabitha means Dorcas in another language In our language, the name translates to the word gazelle. It means, it implies, one is gracious. In antiquity, in the ancient Near East, gazelles were seen as gracious beings, gracious animals, smooth and and fluid in the way they, they moved. To call a woman a gazelle was to say she is gracious in the way she treats the world. Here's Tabitha, this gracious one, this gazelle in the church, as it were, who creates a welfare program for poor widows. She provides them dignity and and worth by making tunics and, and clothing for them. Remember, if you were a widow in antiquity, you had basically two options to survive. One was to go into slavery, the other was to go into begging. But in the church, this 
kind, gracious disciple, she's called by Luke, this woman disciple organizes a ministry to care for the least of these. She doesn't wait for the men to gather and vote and decide and discuss and, and take forever to do something. She just organizes and goes and makes it happen. It's Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza, a theologian, who says that in the first century, as in our day, the majority of those who are poor and starving are women and children, unable, unable to receive anything from the patriarchal culture. Fiorenza wrote those words 40 years ago. She knows what she's talking about when she says patriarchal culture. Even though she was in a progressive mainline uh, collection of, of scholars, she was still marginalized and put down. Why? Not because of her work. She's brilliant. I read her work when I was in seminary in the 80s. Why was she put down? Because of her gender, because of who she, how she identified. She knows that patriarchy is still a battle to, to be fought. And yet she also knows what Tabitha knew instinctually. That it's the call of the church to reach out to those on the edge, to take care of those who might otherwise be forgotten and ignored by society. And then a crisis happens. You heard the story. Tabitha dies. Her life is over. The crisis in the community, in the city of Joppa where she lives, is what will we do? How will we continue to care for these on the edge? How will we continue to, to, to bring dignity to the lives of these who otherwise might not have it? We've got to do something. And so a, a group is organized. They go off to a city nearby 10, 10 miles away. It would take three and a half hours to walk, but they don't care. They've got to get there to bring Peter back in to help them deal with this crisis. That's what the community of faith does. When there's a crisis, the community of faith gathers together, discusses what can it do, how can we help. We've done that here in this church church in light of the Ukrainian war and the huge massive amount of, of refugees that it's created, we've given over $65,000, I think it's over $65,000 in support of these refugees in need, in desperate need. What does the church do? It responds when there's a crisis. The community of faith gets together and determines to find a way where there otherwise may be no way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the German theologian, wrote the classic text on Christian community titled Life Together. In this book, he proclaims that a spirit of judgmentalism comes from self-justification. When we try to justify ourselves, we almost always end up judging others. When we allow ourselves to be justified by grace, it opens our hearts and minds and hands to be servants. Too often the church has been caught up, he says, in self-justification, missing its calling to be gracious and to allow that grace to send them out into the world to care for the ones Jesus calls the least of these. Now, lest you think that Bonhoeffer wrote these words from some high ivory tower somewhere where he was dispensing his wisdom on the people below, you need to know that he wrote in the midst of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. His book was published, I think, in 1939. He wrote in the midst of fear and terror. He wrote in the midst of a, of a nation where the church, for the most part, abandoned their call as followers of Jesus and instead gave over themselves to totalitarianism, some of them out of fear, frankly, some of them because they liked it. Anytime the church gets caught up in allowing a totalitarian or autocratic leader to control the world, the country, whatever it might be, it's time for us to sit up and pay close attention to remember whose we are and who calls us. It was Bonhoeffer who eventually ended up in a Nazi prison camp. It was Bonhoeffer who continued to organize Christian community within that camp, communities of faith where they would gather to share ideas and stories and read scripture and share prayers. And it was Bonhoeffer who was murdered the day before the war ended by the Nazis in that prison camp. He gave his life, literally, for this work of creating community, communities of faith that would reach out in the midst, in the midst of the crisis. Peter arrives in Joppa finally. He goes to the house where her body is laid out. 
And he says, Tabitha, get up. She opens her eyes. She sees Peter. She sits up. Now this morning, don't let the miracle get in the way of the point. Miracles in the Bible are always, almost always pointing to something deeper, richer, and greater. What this miracle says is the community of faith, the church of Jesus Christ, can never allow those on the margins to be forgotten, missed, left behind, allowed to suffer and even die. It is the church's call continually, every day of our lives together as people of faith, to do what we can for each other and for the world, regardless of whether they're members of our church or members of our faith or anything else. It is our calling to never let that happen. This miracle points toward this, this community of faith in Joppa, making a difference in their world. Now, Luke names the city of Joppa in particular because he knows most of his readers will recognize that name and remember a story from their Bibles. Do you remember the story? There was a prophet named Jonah from, who found his way to Joppa. Jonah was called by God to go north to Nineveh to preach there and to proclaim God's grace and love to those in Nineveh. But Jonah, frankly, was a racist. He hated the Ninevites. He didn't want to spend any time with them. And so rather than go there, he got on a boat in Joppa and took up to go as far away as he could. You know the story, right? There's a storm comes up. He's tossed over in the storm. He's swallowed by a fish. The fish takes him down to the bottom of the sea for three days. And then the fish makes its way back to the shore where Jonah is burped out. That's the nice way to say it. He's burped out onto the beach and he's not back at Joppa. Where is he? At Nineveh. Do you, do you see this story? It's a comedy tale. No matter how messy things get, God is going to come to us in the middle of the mess. Could there be anything messier than the belly of a whale? Again, don't get caught up in the miracle. Just pay attention to the story. What a gross, disgusting place. But even there in that body of the whale, God is working on Jonah, working on him, making sure the fish brings him back to the place where the word needs to be heard. He preaches the worst sermon ever given, but nonetheless, the entire city turns their hearts and minds over to the ways of God. Do you see how inclusive this word is? It's not for us to hold on to. It's for us to share. It's for us to open our minds and hearts up to the leading and the work of God's gracious love. But it's easy, it's easy to sometimes add some bricks to those walls, to sometimes erect a fence, because it just can feel so uncomfortable to let those in from the margins. They might be wearing jeans or no shoes, have long hair and beards. I'd like to think 50 years later we're over that, but what is it today? What is it today? that blocks us. You know, the overarching message of the Bible from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation is of the good news of God's love given not just to those who think a particular way, but to the entire world. Are there problematic texts in the Old Testament? Oh, absolutely. We mentioned one from Deuteronomy. Are there problematic texts in the New Testament? Yes, there are. But the overarching message from beginning to end is that God wants to move into the mess of our lives and bring us hope, grace, faith, and love. Think about Genesis 1. At the very beginning of all that is, according to this ancient poet who wrote this chapter, there's a chaotic mess just swirling around. It's this huge chaotic mess. And the divine voice said, let there be light. Maybe that's a word for you and me this morning. Maybe there's a word not just for the church, but for us, for you, and for me. Is there some part of your soul that's a darkened, chaotic mess? Is there some part of your life where you hope to God that there will never be a light shined upon that? Maybe that's the place. A messy place, a, a, me a messy place like, like one who has become a eunuch through no choice of his own, one who has died tragically in the middle of serving the church, one who's been sent off to 
preach in a strange place like Nineveh. Maybe it's in the mess where God's spirit in your life is ready to work, to shine a light, not to expose, not to demean or cast judgment upon you, but to create a place of growth, of hope, of life. Rachel Held Evans, the one we've quoted already this morning a couple of times, she says that most of the time it's the mess where God's spirit goes. Most of the time when we're in the mess, it feels uncomfortable. But maybe what we need to do, she says, is to learn to be uncomfortable for God. To let that light shine in you, in me, so that we can find our way together so the church can find its way. Maybe the messiness of the church is the place we need to go, the one place where it seems like everything's crazy and makes no sense. Maybe that's where the new beginning begins. May God bless us as we open ourselves up to this very spirit. Amen. Let us go on this day and make our way into the mess of the world, believing and trusting that even in the mess, God's Spirit is with us. Let's go on this day, opening our hearts to the leading of that Spirit, our minds to the understanding of it, so that we can truly give ourselves away to a world desperately in need of love, hope, and grace. Amen.